All right. Um, so I'm going to let you introduce yourself and explain what your position is and maybe how long you've been working for CPS and what kind of different things you've done for them. Okay. My name is Roberta Stevens and I'm this uh, conservatorship unit uh, supervisor for Hill County. Um, I've been with CPS for over 18 years now. Uh, I started out working in investigations and then I moved to a generic unit where we handle all stages of services. Um, then I went and uh, was a special investigator for a while where I did uh, serious child abuse cases and child death school uh, cases and things like that. Then I moved over to conservatorship um, as a supervisor. And I've been doing that now for about nine years, eight or nine years. Wow. You've done everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you have done everything, yes. All right. So in Hill County, um, how many conservatorship workers do we have and how many investigators do we have? Okay, they have, uh, I believe, seven investigators right now. Uh, and we have, sorry, five uh, conservatorship workers in the Hillsboro office. I also have... Uh, three positions in uh, Hamilton also. Okay, so uh, a lot of our cases start with FBSS, Family-Based Safety Services. Are you involved with that at all? <laughs> no, the, uh, um, the only time we get involved is after investigations when they remove a child or if uh, they open up a case for family-based safety services and something happens that they have to remove the children in the home, uh, then we work with them then. We're usually familiar kind of through the office about what's going on with everybody. We work together. Okay, so when a child's removed from their home, who finds that first placement? How do they decide where they're gonna go? Okay, when they do the investigation and they have decided to remove the children, they ask the families if they have any family members, friends, close uh, neighbors, anybody that could take the children and watch them. Um, some parents will name off quite a few people, some, pe some won't have anybody. So what they do is they'll have to go and uh, <clears throat> Uh, do a background check and all that investigations does. They go and do a preliminary home ass assessment and then they uh, will place the children there or if they can't find a suitable family member that can pass our background checks or um, they're not sure about, then they'll place the children in foster care and uh, then we will uh, we'll do a home, a regular long home study and then we will place the children back with relatives or, or fictive kin or something like that. Okay. But we have a central placement unit that we call CPU and they, uh, we send in a request and they find all our placements for us. Okay. So how soon will the parent be able to see the child after they're removed? Um, usually within 72 hours, the investigation set up that first visit and then it transfers to us. <clears throat> and uh, when it transfers to us, we set up the visits from there. And when does it transfer to your, to the conservatorship department? Okay. Whenever there's a removal, usually within uh, 24 hours, um, or two days, <laughs> uh, we get a notification of the removal and I assign it to a worker and then they make them secondary on the case so that they can start uh, working with setting up things with the family. We're not actually made primary until after the adversary hearing. Um, 
however, the cases usually are already to us between, I'm going to say between five and 14 days. Okay. They're already permanently in our union. Okay. But we, we have a, what we call a removal staffing that happens on the Friday following the removal. And then after that's when they transfer it over to us. So it just depends on when the staffing is. Okay. What kinds of services are the parents asked to do? Okay. And we're, we do what's called the FSNA, which is a family strength and needs assessment. And what we do with that is we go and we talk to the parents and we find out, you know, what's going on in their life, what they've been through, how their childhood was. And we try to identify what is causing the, um, behaviors for the abuse and neglect of the children uh, and when we do that that'll help us identify services for example um, if they have drug use that's a big problem and we want to get them into treatment as soon as possible because if they're in treatment and they get treatment then they can do the other services and they can learn from those services if they're still using then they you know, they really don't gain from parenting and all that if they're still using. But we provide parenting, uh, psychosocials, psychologicals, anger management, counseling, uh, individual and family counseling. Um, we did do some domestic violence, refer people for uh, psychiatric uh, consultation if the is recommended by the um, psychological. Um, make, we send them to MHMR and those kind of things. So who pays for those services? CPS. Okay. We, we do a form called the 2054 and that pays for the services. Okay. So what does CPS expect the parents to do as far as seeking those services? Do they have to go out on their own and find them? No, what we do is the caseworkers will, um, after we determine what kind of services they need, that's how we create our family plan. Um, we, uh, we then make referrals to the different places and we give that to the parents, the contact information, who to call and set it up and so forth. And, and they do that, or if they need help with that, we can help them with that. Okay. So they have to, they have to call, they have to have some kind of buy-in. They have to make some effort to set to yes. Yes. scheduled services, but they're given all the information they need to do that. Yes, and it's a written um, sheet that they're given with everything on it so that they have that in writing. Okay, so what kinds of things does CPS do for the children? What kind of services do you provide for the kids? Okay, and the kids have a, a CANS assessment, which is the child's uh, needs and assessment. And that helps us understand what the children need, uh, therapy, uh, play therapy, or different kinds of therapy. They may need to be referred to early childhood intervention for services, for speech therapy, occupational therapy, and those types of things. Any medical needs that they have, we meet those medical needs, because sometimes we do have children with medical needs. And just anything they need, we put in their child plan and develop a plan to meet those needs, and we provide all those services. How often does the caseworker go and visit the child? Um, they go and see the child face-to-face -face monthly. Um, sometimes it's more, but it's a minimum of monthly, once a month. Okay. Do the case... If the child... If the child is out of region, then they assign a local permanency specialist and those uh, workers go see the children out of region. Okay. Um, so does the caseworker typically go to the school the children attend? 
Um, they can, uh, they don't normally do that. We normally see the children in the home. Uh, occasionally we will go to a school or daycare, um, but most of the time the visits are in the, in the home itself. Okay, so um, who supervises the visits between the parents and the children? Okay, and that's done jointly by the workers and the HSTs, which is our, our uh, case aides or techs. And also we do have some, not very many, but we do have some contracted supervisions that we can contract it out to and they can do the visits. Okay. Um, if they're in a relative placement and we're uh, and they are working services and we can see that they are able to be supervised by the caregivers or the children, then sometimes we let them do it as well. Do parents have to pass a drug test in order to have visits with their kids? Only if that's ordered by the judge. Normally um, what we do is our best practice guide and we don't want to punish the children and a lot of times the parents haven't uh, got their services set up so we don't want to punish them either but we go ahead and as long as they're not uh, appearing under the influence or acting strange or anything like that um, and it's supervised by the department then we will allow them to visit. Okay, so typically if they show up under the influence, they could. Okay, how often are the parents drug tested in a typical case if they have substance abuse issues? And in each case is different. We go by the color system by the most part, um, and that's where they have to call in every day to see if their color is chosen for that day, and if it is, then they have to go drug test that day. Um, we have different colors indicate different am amounts of drug tests per month. So just depending on if it's real severe, they'll go four or five, six times. If, if it's less then they may go, you know, two or three times. Okay. Just depends. Where do they have to go to get their drug tests? Um, in Hill County, most of them go to uh, Hill Regional. Uh, there's a drug testing facility over there, and uh, I don't have the address of it, but um, that's where we send them. Every now and then we do send them to Waco. If they have to do like a uh, nail bed test, then they have to go to Waco for that. Okay, so explain how you decide what kind of drug test they're gonna have. Cause they can have a UA, a hair follicle or a nail bed test. What determines what kind of tests they're having and how much, and what kind of different information do you get from each test? Okay. Uh, normally when they go and they do just, uh, we send them to the lab for a drug test, that's a UA. Um, and that's the typical drug test that we use. It, uh, it shows up all different kinds of drugs, but as you know, on the market, they have so many different ways that people can pass a drug test that if we suspect that they're using drugs because of their behavior and something and they're passing their UAs, we can require a hair follicle. And that hair follicle goes back uh, about six months, maybe longer, depending on their hair growth, and it'll tell us, get a better range of, of what they are doing. Uh, sometimes people will dye their hair or put uh, extensions or something like that in and we can't get a true hair follicle test or they don't have any hair, they shave everywhere on their body. Mm -hmm. So we will have to re uh, ask the judge for a nail bed. And those ones go back and, and it's really hard unless you cut all your nails off to uh, not pass a, a nail bed test. They're pretty accurate. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, the cost of volunteers and the caseworkers working together. What's the best way for a cost of volunteer to communicate with the caseworker? Um, by email and, and by phone. 
a lot of times they're in meetings or they're busy and they can't answer their phone, but they do reply back by text message. They all have a work cell phone and they will apply a reply with text messages, but usually email, text message, and, and actually calling them is the best way. Or, I mean, if you want to go, if they want to talk to them in person, I would advise them to call ahead of time and set up a time to make sure they're in the office and have time to talk to them. So how many cases does each caseworker typically have? Right now, they're a little bit high, and everybody in uh, Hillsboro has approximately 18 or 19 cases. Wow. And we count our cases by children. Okay. All right. Um, so do the caseworkers get a copy of the CASA court report before hearings? They are supposed to, yes. And if we get them ahead of time, they do get them um, uh, occasionally. And I'm not saying it's Hill County, but some counties, we don't get them till like the day before. And they may or may not have a chance to look at them. All right. Okay. So it's important for the CASA of volunteer to get their reports in early so that the caseworker gets a copy of it before the hearing. Yes, and if they keep in contact with the worker, especially when we're coming up on a court hearing, if they call and say, hey, we, I just want to see if we're on the same page or not, what is, you know, that would help. Okay. And my workers need to get better at that as well. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about what, um, what kind of things can the CASA volunteer that helps the caseworker? What kind of, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? What kind of things can the CASA volunteer do that help the caseworker? Um, well, the CASA volunteers, they're able to go out and do visits and, and talk to children and anything that they find is not going right or not uh, information that we may not have, if they could report that to us as soon as they find out so we can either intervene and do whatever we need to or just have that information that helps. Okay. What would you like the CASA volunteers to know about what they should never do? I've asked everybody this, this question that I've interviewed. What should the CASA volunteer never do? And I want you to tell them Please don't do this. Um, well, uh, part of it is that uh, we do have cost workers that go and they tell uh, family members what other family members or other people have said and that's all should be confidential and they should never discuss the case between the, the parties. Uh, um, they shouldn't go and talk to the judge about a case with without because that's ex parte and the judge. Um, and um, always, uh, if they do talk to somebody and they find something. So if, if they, if the CASA volunteer has an issue with maybe a placement or something, what should they do as far as, you know, trying to get that resolved? Yeah, they need to contact the worker and let them know their concerns and then we can check that out. And if there's, uh, we find the same concerns and if it's necessary, we can request a placement kind of. All right, is there anything else, any other advice you want to give to our new volunteers um, about what they're about to start doing? I think that it's, uh, it's always said through us that we agree to disagree because we don't always have the same views as Costa does and that's okay. Um, but when we do that, we don't want them to hold that against us because we may not Feel the same way they do but it's just the you know 
it's just a different way of seeing things. But I think that a good communication with their worker and giving their worker time to uh, get back to them <laughs> is good because I, I want them to know that our workers have a high caseload and sometimes it takes a little bit to get back to them. So if you call, they have 24 hours to call you back. And if they don't call you back, uh, within that 24 hours, then you can contact me and, and let me know. But uh, a lot of times CASA will send uh, them a, a message by phone or whatever, and then they haven't answered in an hour. So then they're blowing up their phone wanting more. And if it's an emergency and they let them know, hey, you leave a message. Because if you just call and you don't leave a message, they're not gonna call you back. Mm -hmm. So leave a message for them that you need to talk to them. And if it's emergency, you can always call the office and, and get them to get me or them on the phone. Okay, great. But working together is, is and having a good relationship is key to everything. It absolutely is. And um, our volunteers, I, I hope we've done a good job of, of helping them understand that the, the CBS caseworkers have a whole bunch of cases and our volunteers only have one to focus right. on. There's a huge difference there as far as time and urgency. Um, so hopefully yeah. we all will work good together. Uh, we have in the past, anytime that you know there's an issue, they can contact you, they can contact their supervisor. Um, and, and the yeah. most is just to try to work things out together and to work together as a team to be able to help the kids. Yes, and, and just to understand when we have differences, it's not because we're just doing that because we don't like the cause of worker, it's just that's the way we see things. Absolutely. All right, well, thank you, Roberta. I appreciate you so much. Um, we look forward to All working, right. thank you. working with you and your, and your um, conservatorship department, and uh, we'll be seeing you in court. All right. Thank you. Thank you.